Assemblée. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Petro Poroshenko, President of Ukraine. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome to the United Nations His Excellency Petro Poroshenko, President of Ukraine, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Distinguished Mr. President, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Ukraine, I sincerely congratulate distinguished Mr. Morgan Slikintov on the election as a president of the 70th session of the United Nations General Assembly. I wish you, Mr. President, every success in your activity in this crucial historic moment. Our future will largely depend on the outcomes of this session and our collective decision whether we will choose to follow the path of peace, security, human rights, or will plunge into the turmoil of new hybrid wars, chaos, and suffering. Dear Mr. President, at the moment of the organization anniversary, I am proud to speak on behalf of the one of the UN-founded members, the state which back in 1945 took active part in the San Francisco Conference, contributed to the establishment of the organization and laid down the foundation of its activity. The state which added a lot in San Francisco to shape the heart of UN Charter, its purposes and principles. Regrettably, I am also speaking on behalf of UN member states, which is now suffering from the brutal violation of the fundamental norms and principles of United Nations Charter. The statement on Ukraine joining the United Nations as one of the founding members, which was delivered at the San Francisco Conference, emphasized, I quote, Ukraine has repeatedly been the subject of bloody invention by the aggressor that for the centuries have sought to capture its territory." End of quote. It has been a long time since that landmark event. But today, I have to recall that my country has become the object of the external aggression. This time, aggressor is the Russian Federation. Neighboring country, former strategic partner, that legally pledged to respect the sovereignty, territorial integrity, independence, and inviolability of the borders of Ukraine. This country used to be a guarantor of Ukraine's security under the Budapest Memorandum, whereby security guarantees were provided to my country in exchange for the voluntary renunciation of the world's third nuclear arsenal. Moreover, this state is a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, which is entrusted by the UN Charter with the maintaining international peace in security. In February 2014, Russia conducted open and unprovoked aggression against my country, having occupied and annexed the Crimea bluntly and brutally violating the international law, the shock in the whole world community. And I am deeply grateful to the delegation of the majority of our organization member states that the last year supported the resolution of the United Nations General Assembly entitled Territorial Integrity of Ukraine, which condemned the Russian illegal annexation of Crimea. It is regrettable that after this clear verdict of the international community, Russia did not return to the civilized international legal field. 
Moreover, Moscow started a new military reckless game, this time in Ukraine, Donbas region. Despite the fact that until now, Russia refused to officially admit its direct military invasion, today there is no doubt that this is an aggressive war against my country, against Ukraine. To mislead the world community, Russian leadership orders to take off insignias of its military servicemen and identification mark of its military equipment, to abandon its soldiers captured on the battlefield and cynically use mobile crematorium to eliminate traces of its crime on Ukrainian soil. And I would like to stress, it is neither a civil war, not an internal conflict. Ukrainian territories occupied by Russia in the Crimea and Donbas region constitute approximately 44,000 square kilometers. Millions of Ukrainians have found themselves under the occupation. The goal of this war is to force Ukrainian people to give up its sovereign choice in build free, democratic, prosperous, and European state. All this takes place against the backdrop of the traitorous rhetoric about brotherly people, common history, related language, and predestined common future. In fact, we are dealing here with a desire to return to the imperial times with a sphere of influence, a desperate attempt to obtain self-affirmation at others' expense. For over the 20 months, Russia's aggression against my country has been continued through the financing of terrorists and mercenaries and supply of armed and military equipment to illegal armed groups in Donbas. Over the last few days, we have had a conciliatory statement from the Russian side in which, in particular, it called for the establishment of the anti-terrorist coalition or when the fire danger to flirt with the terrorists. Cool story, but really hardly to believe. How can you urge an anti-terrorist coalition if you inspire terrorism right in front of your own door? How can you talk about the peace and legitimacy if your policy is war via puppet government? How can you speak for freedom for nation if you punish your neighbor for this choice? How can you demand respect for all if you don't have respect for anyone? The Gospel of John teaches us, in the beginning was the Word. But what kind of the Gospel do you bring to the world if all your words are double-tongued like that? Back to the situation in Donbass. I have to state that here we are forced to fight proper fully armed regular troops of armed forces of the Russian Federation. Heavy weaponry and military equipment are concentrated on the occupied territory in such quantities that armies of the majority of UN member states can only dream about. These are, in particular, the state-of-art samples of military equipment of Russian production, which are unlikely according to the well-known assumption of the Russian president, might be purchased in the ordinary army store. Unless, of course, such a wholesale store with a free shipping from the Russian Federation. During this period, more than 8,000 Ukrainians, of whom about 6,000 civilians died at the hand of the Russian-backed terrorists and occupiers in Ukraine and Donbass. More than one and a half million residents of Donbas were forced to flee their home and became internally displaced persons moving other safer region of Ukraine. And I would like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to the international community 
for the considerable effort in providing necessary assistance to the people in need. At the same time, I call upon the United Nations and the other international actors to continue to pay special attention to this very important issue. I would like to draw your attention that is not the first time that the permanent member of the United Nations Security Council is undermining peace, insecurity at both regional and international level. For over 24 years that have passed since questionable procedure of transfer, the Permanent Security Council membership of the former Soviet Union to the Russian Federation, it is not only the hybrid war that Russia has unleashed, in fact, in order to preserve influence in neighboring countries, Russia for decades has deliberately created around itself the belt of instability. These are Nagorny Karabakh, Transnistria, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Crimea, and Donbass. All of these are protracted conflicts which supported by or directly relation to Russia. But the Kremlin goes further on. These days, the Russian men in green treat on Syria left. What and who is next? Dear Mr. President, in every democratic country, if someone stole your property, the independent court would restore the justice in order to protect rights and punish the offender. However, we must recognize that in the 21st century, our organization lacks an effective instrument to bring the aggressor country to justice, which has stolen the territory of another sovereign state. Seventy years ago, the creator of the United Nations Charter have envisaged the mechanism of the UN Security Council sanction to be one of the restraining tools applying in response to the breaches of peace and acts of aggression. However, they couldn't even imagine that this tool will be needed against the aggressor state that is a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. Since the beginning of the aggression, Russia used its veto right twice, while the United Nations Security Council was considered a question related to Ukraine. At the outset, Russia blocked a draft resolution condemning the fake referendum on the Crimea annexation in March 2014. Me personally, as a Ukrainian member of parliament, was exactly at the time when they say that it was a voting on the enunciation of this fake referendum. There was no member of parliament. It was just the Russian soldiers surrounded the parliament of Crimea. The second time Russia puts its shameful veto on the draft of the resolution on establishment of the International Tribunal to investigate and bring to justice all responsible for the Malaysian MH17 plane crash. By imposing its disgraceful veto on this draft resolution, Russia clearly demonstrated that the whole world is defined in establishing the truth. Not just the truth about the perpetrators of the, these terroristic attacks and arms used to shut down that plane. What is most important, it is the truth about those who organized this crime and from which country the mentioned arms had been transported. I think everyone in this hall clearly understands the real motive of Russia's veto on the MH17 tribunal. Moreover, the establishment of the international peacekeeping operation, which could lead to the stabilization of the situation in Ukraine and stop the bloodshed, had been also blocked because of the potential threat of the Russia's veto. Abuse of the veto right, its usage as a license to kill, is absolutely unacceptable. The collective voice of our organization should be absolutely clear. Ukraine stands for the graduate limitation of the veto right with its further consolation. 
veto power should not become an act of grace and pardon for the crime, which could be used any time and pulled off from the sleeve in order to avoid fair punishment. In this context, I welcome the initiative of my French colleague and friend, President Hollande, supported by President Peña Nieto of Mexico, on the political declaration to restrain from veto rights amongst P5 members in case of the mass atrocities. Primary attention should be given to the modernization of the UN Security Council, including enlargement of its membership and improvement of its method of work. The membership of the UN Security Council should reflect the realities of the 21st century by representing the larger quantity of African, Asian, and Latin American states. Additional non-permanent seats in the Council should be given to the Eastern European Group. Its composition doubled during the last two decades. Ukraine also considered improvement of the peacekeeping and peacebuilding architecture of the organization as an important element of United Nations reforms. And I am proud of Ukraine's international reputation as an active and devoted contributor to the United Nations peacekeeping operation. Despite the external challenges, we remain a reliable partner of organization in this noble matter. The contribution of Ukraine to the maintenance of the international peace and security provides us with the moral grounds to count on the same assistance from the organization in time of vital importance of this issue for my country. The special peacekeeping mission in Donbas under the United Nations auspice could become a very useful instrument contributing to the implementation of the Minsk Agreement. Ukraine is committed to follow the letter and the spirit of the Minsk deal. We demand the same approach from other signatories that have lately restored it to the language of blackmail. Otherwise, there is no alternative to sanction and even their strengthening, as well as there is no alternative to the peaceful resolution of the crisis. Full access of the OEC monitor to the all occupied territory, withdrawal of the Russian military forces, military equipment, as well as the mercenaries from the territory of Ukraine, restoration, full control by, by Ukraine over the state border with Russia must be secured. Freedom, peace, respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity. Ukraine doesn't demand more. However, it will not settle for less. <laughs> Dear Mr. President, unfortunately, not my own free will today. Ukraine is on as a one of the areas to fight against, fight against terrorist threat. We strongly condemn terrorism in all its form and manifestation. The activity of ISIL, Al Qaeda, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, the others, is a global challenge. The only possible way to address it is to unite in common and non-compromised fight against this evil. International terrorism has proved to be more flexible than the political will of the nation, and today it's taken a new hybrid form. State and non-state actors have become interlinked. The struggle for one's rights is substituted for the ruthless terror. We are convinced that the need for the universal international instrument able to counteract this crime is not only the urgent, but long overdue. For this reason, the conclusion of the preparatory work on the draft of the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Combating of the Terrorism should become one of the top priority for this 70th session. A special role in the fight against international terrorism should be given to the most reputable legal institution, the International Court for Justice and the International Criminal Court. Making the jurisdiction of this institution universal is the core element of the overcoming impunity of actual violation 
as well as their apartment, the regime whose national policy has become the mass production of terror. And I strongly believe that one of the most important aspects fighting against terrorism is keeping and sharing the memory of the victims. And in this context, I propose that the 17th session of the General Assembly consider the establishment of the International Day of the Commemoration of the Memory of the Victims of the Terrorist Act. My president, Mr. President, it was my feeling that humiliation, disregard of the people, will, and the violation their fundamental rights that prompt Ukrainians to leave their homes for protest in 1913, in 2013, which was the beginning of our revolution of dignity. Ukraine has paid and continues to pay an extremely high price for its freedom and the right to live in a free country, the price of the human life. This is why the interest of every single individual and the protection of the people's rights laid in the foundation of my large-scale reform program launched a year ago. For the first time in 24 years of its independence, Ukraine adopted the national human rights strategy. It took into account the best international practice from the human rights perspective, including the European Union's strategic framework on human rights and democracy. Russian aggression exposed the problem of securing the human rights in the Crimea and the certain area of Donetsk and Lugansk region. Leading international human rights organizations have alerted about the radical deterioration of human rights situation which directly apply to Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar in the occupied Crimea. And I'm referring specifically to the practice used by the occupation authority in the Crimea to enlist forcefully into Russian citizenship as well as to the systematic persecution, arrest, abduction and killing pro-Ukrainian residents of peninsula and complete elimination of the independent media. Ukraine reaffirms its commitment to the UN Declaration of Right of Indigenous People. By the legal means, we will continue to defend the rights of the Crimean Tatar, the indigenous people of Ukraine, and the Ukrainians who are suffering from the repressive policy of the occupation authority in the Crimea. And I believe that the problem of blatant violation of human rights in Crimea deserve a particular consideration within UN General Assembly. And I hope that the decision to address this issue will be taken during the current session. I also feel obliged to mention the name of Nadia Savchenko, Alek Sinsov, Alexander Kolchenko, and many other Ukrainians, political prisoners of the Kremlin, illegally detained and sentenced. For example, Alek Sinsov, a respected filmmaker, was sentenced for 23 years in prison only for being Ukrainian patriot. And I call upon the United Nations and its member states to launch a worldwide campaign to pressure on Russian authorities to immediately release all Ukrainian citizens which they hold hostage. We will be able to achieve our goal only if our action would be global. Most of all, Ukraine needs solidarity and assistance which is really a powerful instrument against aggression and injustice. Ukraine will win, sure, because truth is on our side. But we will do it much faster if we will feel support and solidarity of the whole international community. The ongoing hybrid war of Russia against Ukraine has demonstrated that the international community is facing another challenge which requires consolidation of our efforts. And the full-scale information war and the propaganda campaign have become particularly destructive form of non-military aggression. Fake news, blood and lies spread to justify the aggression, propaganda of intolerance and violence are phenomena of the same range which undermine the principle of freedom of expression and poison human soul and mind. That is why the task of strengthening the role of information in the maintenance of the peace and security is more important than ever. And I call upon the General Assembly 
to strongly condemn this shameful phenomena and to discuss the ways to confront them. Mr. President, despite the above mentioned external challenges, Ukraine is fully committed to the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. We are ready to share joint responsibility for the solving specific vital problem and priorities of the most vulnerable group of countries such as small island states. Ukraine as a member of Friends of Climate Group is looking forward to reach consensus on the universal agreement in the area of climate change as soon as possible. We hope that this result will be achieved by United Nations member states in the December this year in Paris. We have to understand that the price of this issue would be safety of future generations and sustainable development of the main country. The path toward the achievement of the sustainable development goals will not be successful without overcoming and preventing consequences of the environmental and technological disasters. As a result of the Russian aggression, Ukraine faced another challenge, the protection of the environment in Donbas. Irresponsible and criminal flooding of mines by terrorists led to the poisoning of drinking water, soil, flora and fauna in the region. The atmosphere is polluted due to explosion and shelling of sensitive industrial infrastructure. In fact, we can speak about the risk of environmental disaster, and I am convinced that the issue of the environment protection under the condition of the conflict needs special attention of the United Nations Environment Assembly. Speaking about the technological disaster, I cannot but recall one of the most horrific of them. Next year we will, will mark the sad anniversary, 30 years since the tragedy of Chernobyl nuclear power station. And I would like to request you, Mr. President, to hold a special meeting of the General Assembly dedicated to the 30th anniversary of the Chernobyl disaster in April 2016. Mr. President, in my country's address on the occasion of joining United Nations, it is said, I quote, Ukraine, with its vast human strength and material resources, will be able to make a significant contribution to maintaining peace and global security, end of quote. Just like it was 70 years ago, I reiterate Ukraine's unwavering commitment to further undertake maximum efforts to save succeeding generations from the course of war, ensured in the United Nations Charter. Achievement of this noble goal will be the cornerstone of Ukraine non-permanent membership in the United Nations Security Council for the period 2016-2017 if elected. In this capacity, Ukraine will remain the reliable and consistent partner guided not by own but the global agenda and resolutely following the spirit and letter of the Charter. And I am firmly convinced that the organization will pass with the dignity, the extremely complex test, and strengthen its role as a guarantor of world order, peace, and prosperity. Let God be with us. Thank all of you for the attention. Islava Ukraine. In nombre de la Asamblea General. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the President of Ukraine for the statement just made. May I request representatives to remain seated while we greet the President.